Welcome to our Lacta webinar, Feeding Vulnerable Infants with Breast Milk in Diverse Neonatal Hospital Settings, where international experts will explore vulnerable infant feeding challenges and solutions from the practical experiences. Thank you very much for joining. My name is Arancha de la Horra. I'm a nurse and a midwife, also a member of the Global Health Network, and I will be facilitating today's session. This is our agenda for today. Uh, for today's LACTA webinar, Professor Chia will start introducing our topic, feeding preterm and low birth weight infants with breast milk in diverse neonatal hospital settings. And he'll also be presenting our three expert sessions with Dr. Yidi, Ilian, Uiva, and Dr. Sushma. We will run two poll sessions for you, the audience, to vote and give us your opinions. And finally, we will open the floor to questions from the audience in a session moderated by Lydia Owusu. Next slide, please. And today we will start this webinar introducing our moderators. Professor Dr. Fok Cho Chia, he is a professor in pediatrics in neonatology in the faculty of Faculty of Medicine at the University of Gebangshan, Malaysia. He's a senior consultant neonatologist, counselor to Anko Moris Hospital and children, Children's Specialist Hospital in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. He's also a joint profession of pediatrics in neonatology at the Ilanga University, Surabaya in Indonesia. And Lydia Owusu, she is a lecturer at the Department of Nursing at the Kawame Krumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana. She's also part-time faculty at the Ghana College of Nurses and Midwives. She is a registered nurse a, with a specialty in pediatric nursing and an expertise in newborn care, and she is a registered dietitian. And now, Prof. Chia uh, will start with the topic and expert introduction. Welcome, Prof. Chia, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. It, I'm very pleased actually today to have this opportunity to come to moderate this session and to be able to, um, you know, to discuss this very important topic on breastfeeding to the um, and the use of breast milk to the vulnerable, vulnerable group of infants. And I think it's very appropriate that we have this topic of discussion in uh, this week when we're celebrating the uh, World Breastfeeding Week. And it's certainly something that we need to, um, to promote um, in this very important area for the, for the optimal growth as well as uh, development of this uh, group of preterm infants, especially those low birth weight and extremely premature ones. And um, I'm very grateful that Lecter Hub has actually uh, initiated this uh, program for us, this webinar. And uh, in conjunction and with the collaboration uh, with uh, the Global Health Network, and I think this is something that uh, hopefully will um, start off uh, the ball rolling for more to come uh, in promoting this agenda of feeding as, and as well as uh, optimizing the growth of preterm infants. Um, and I'm very happy also that um, there are many in the audience I know who who are friends and who are colleagues and who we have not met for many years. Um, and uh, I'd like to say a special hi to those uh, who, who know who they are, who are actually connected uh, uh, by email when we see each other and uh, we, when, when this uh, webinar was actually promoted online. Um, so I think without further ado, I would like to also uh, welcome all the participants from every corner of the world, I think. Uh, this is a global event, and it's a global agenda as well, so it's very appropriate. And uh, we like to learn from each other um, how to, we can actually optimize the use of breast milk and in terms of promoting breastfeeding to this special, special vulnerable group of infants. Uh, and we're very uh, fortunate also to have uh, three speakers with us today um, who have very accomplished uh, CVs and have worked tremendously in this area, um, in the area of uh, monitoring growth of preterm infants, in the area of uh, optimizing and utilizing breast milk, as well as in setting up human milk banks. And finally, in training staff in the 
a neonatal intensive care setting in terms of how to uh, optimize the use of breast milk in feeding the preterm. So first, I would like to introduce the, uh, our first speaker, um, who is uh, Dr. Aidi. And Dr. Aidi is from uh, Nigeria. She is a consultant pediatrician in the Department of Pediatrics, uh, UMC College Hospital, Ibadan. And uh, if you look at the CV of Dr. Aidi, it's very impressive. She is really an advocate in all the major uh, childhood killer to, to reduce uh, the mortality and morbidity in areas that are um, being faced uh, in many parts of the world, uh, from malaria to uh, infections and pneumonia. And also, he, she is an um, advocate uh, in terms of uh, training, capacity training to reduce neonatal infections. Uh, proper resuscitation. She's been involved in many trials, including the antenatal corticosteroid trials. And of note, she has received many awards, especially and also research grants, um, ranging from um, grants uh, awarded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations. And she is also a consultant and technical consultant to. Um, the Ministry of Health of uh, Nigeria, uh, World Health Organization, UNICEF, and also the uh, Save the Children International, International as well as Pact West Africa. Um, and she was recognized in November 2019 by Just Actions USA uh, as one of the global 10 women uh, silent heroes fighting pneumonia in, as the leading killer of children globally and was also selected as a Celebrated Health Worker of the Year 2020 on World Health Day. So very accomplished and uh, congratulations and uh, very pleased to have you, Dr. Aed, as one of the speakers. Um, so Dr. Aed will uh, speak um, for the first session in terms of the use of intergrowth for monitoring growth in preterm infants. And then we will go to Dr. Gillian Weaver, um, a very accomplished expert in uh, note banking. Um, she's a note banking specialist and consultant uh, in London, UK, and also a co-founder of the UK Association for Note Banking, as well as EMBA, the European Note Bank Association. Uh, Gillian Weaver, Dr. Gillian Weaver has specialized in the field of human milk bank and breastfeeding for 30 years. So really very rich in experience to be able to share with us today her expertise in this field. Um, she has managed the longest continually operating milk bank in the world at Queen Charlotte's and Chelsea Hospital West London. Um, and she has overseen the growth in activity and its influence between 1989 and 2015, really very illustrious. Um, and she has involved, she has involved, she was in, she's involved in um, and also instrumental in the foundation of the uh, European Milk Bank Association. Uh, she's on the board and she has actually developed, uh, she has been, she's involved in development of the NICE clinical guidelines, uh, 93 donor milk banks service operation. Um, and since 2016, Dr. Weaver has combined two roles as an international human milk banking consultant, providing advice and recommendations for establishment of human milk banks globally. That includes uh, Australia, India, Kenya, as well as Vietnam. And uh, with Dr. Natalie Schenker, she's the co-founder and director of Hearts Milk Bank. And uh, Dr. Gillian also lectures widely, writes on human milk banking, and actively contributes to projects of, of this uh, uh, to projects all over the world. And she is the member of the technical advisory group on the coding system for human milk. I think it's a very important area to make sure um, that um, uh, quality is being uh, preserved as well as. Uh, other relevant uh, data protection that's involved with the use of human milk. Uh, next and the final slot uh, will be taken by Dr. Shushma Nangia. Uh, Dr. Shushma is a professor and head of the Department of Neonatology at Lady Harding Medical College in New Delhi. Um, Dr. Shushma is the 
is um, in charge of this hospital in New Delhi, where she oversees about 14,000 annual births uh, with about 3,000 plus annual neonatal admissions, very busy units indeed. And um, Dr. Nangia is also running a super specialty uh, neonatal degree program. And her interests include neonatal resuscitation, um, human mood banking, kangaroo mother care, and neonatal education epidemiology. So those are our three experts who will be sharing, the ex uh, uh, who will be sharing in their respective fields in today's webinar. And uh, just an introduction um, about this topic that we are going to be uh, discussing. Uh, those of us who are practicing in a, in a neonatal unit will, uh, will know how important it is that we try to get uh, breast milk as much as we can to be able to feed um, um, the preterm infants in the nursery. And we all know how important it is uh, that the breast milk can actually help in terms of optimizing growth, preventing infections, and uh, and and uh, and and um, and also um, contributing to optimal uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes. So, but the only uh, the one of the major issues is that um, you know the accessibility, the availability of this uh, breast milk is usually very lacking. And it's a challenge to most practitioners in this setting because the mothers may not be ready uh, in terms of um, uh, providing adequate breast milk for their infant. And we need to look into these aspects in a very uh, multi-dimensional way so as to address this uh, optimally for the growth and development of this uh, vulnerable group of infants. So I think it's fantastic that we have these uh, three speakers to share with us and also yourselves uh, to come in with opinions and your experiences uh, so that we can learn from each other in addressing this area of need. So without further ado, I would like to... Uh... Well, one second, shall we run the poll before we start? Oh, sorry, I'm yes. sorry, Arantxa. Yes, before that, we like to do a poll and, uh, and uh, Arantxa will help us uh, in uh, running a poll with two questions to gauge uh, your understanding and your appreciation on these two areas that will be asked in the questions. Can we okay, launch Arantxa, the first... Please? Yeah, thank you. Can we launch the first question of the poll? Please, thank you. So we've got the first question is uh, on a scale one to 10, how likely are you to advocate for the implementation of a formal standard or evidence-based practice to ensure vulnerable infants in your health center receive breast milk? And you've got uh, the options for voting is from 10 to one or one to 10. Second question, on a scale one to 10 again, do you believe uh, co-infant feeding practices can be adapted across diverse settings and regions? We welcome Dr. Ayidi. Welcome Dr. Ayidi. Thank you. Good afternoon, good morning or evening, wherever we are. Next slide, please. I will be talking about the, the preterm growth a measurement using the 21st century intergroup chart. Greetings from my institutions, University of Ibadan College of Medicine and University College Hospital Ibadan. Next slide. This is, these are the outline. We talk briefly, few definitions. We'll go ahead and remember how growth monitoring started and why do we have to monitor? What are the things that we look for? What type of growth charts are available? And then a little bit into details about intergrowth chart, the peculiarities and also the advantages. And then also share our institutional experiences about the use of intergrowth 21st century chart. Next slide. We know that in growth, there is a net increase in size or mass of tissues. And this can be as a result of multiplication of cells or increase in intracellular substance. There are factors that actually determine fetal growth, the fetus itself, the placenta, and the maternal factors. So the factors are quite many. And these factors also go ahead even onwards to the postnatal period. And in this, around this time, the genetic potential 
is a major one. But we also have the internal and the external factors, which come in to say that nutrition and care plays a major role in postnatal growth. A growth chart is what is expected to be used. And this is defined as a graphic design of a growth reference and is usually presented as a virtual display and originally is meant for clinical use. Growth reference is a statistical summary of anthropometry in a reference group of children. This is a little bit different from standard, in which case we define standard as representing a head pattern of growth. What is expected for them to grow? The rate at which is expected for them to grow and not the rate at which they are growing. That differentiates between standard and reference. Next slide. We know that the issue of growth charts started a long time ago, between 1920 and, I mean, 1720 and 1785. The first person to actually start plotting a child's body measurement on a child was Kant Philibert. This was not published until later where George Buffon actually published this chart. And that was the first time that a growth curve was uh, made on a chart and made open for everybody. And in this case, height was actually used. And work on growth chart continued. And until 1970, we did, we did not have any uniform population-based standard chart, in which case there are so many now. Next slide. Why do we need to do growth monitoring in preterms? And what are the things that we usually measure? We need growth monitoring. We want to be able to classify the child if it's growing normally or not. We want to be able to detect the type of growth patterns, including growth fortress. And currently, it is recommended that at least we measure the weight, the length, and the occipital frontal circumference. Next slide. Growth monitoring is very important in all newborns and in children generally, but critically, it's even very, very much important in preterm babies. These babies are usually on admission for the initial period of care. And you can discover so many things around this time so that you can limit the morbidities and mortalities that may even come and even the long-term effect of a growth fortune. So within the hospital, when they're on admission, they could have rapid weight gain, in which case we have to think about, is it due to overload, fluid overload, or is it that the baby is having catch-up growth? You also need to check, are they gaining less weight? as expected. If that is the case, think about inadequate nutrition or the fact that the babies may be, may be ill. You are also interested in growth monitoring because it has direct and indirect effect on neurodevelopmental uh, aspects of the baby. We also think about the future of the baby in terms of the metabolic effect. And if the baby is gaining excessive weight, obesity may result later. And even now, more importantly, metabolic syndromes may come later in life as a result of excessive weight gain or problems, chronic problems with nutrition, particularly associated with intrauterine growth restriction. Next slide. Normally, we'll expect babies to be weighed depending on their, their weight, depending on how ill they are, depending on the routine practice. WHO has recommended basic uh, time of weighing. All babies must be weighed at the time of birth. That is not negotiable. They must also be monitored in the particularly after the first week, and then more uh, less frequently as the baby reach the age of three months, and then of course much less frequently frequently after one year of life. This is a table that is recommended, but this table usually is adapted per site, depending on number of staff, the workload, and the feasibility of application and implementation. Next slide. When we are weighing these babies, we are monitoring them. Basically, it's not just monitoring them. 
you want to ensure that they have optimal nutrition. So many factors are, are considered. This is another lecture on its own, but it's just for us to be able to link it with nutrition. We think about the days to comment enteral fix. Now, once there are no uh, specific contraindications, you start enteral fix within the first 24 hours of life. We also, like in our center, we practice a lot of uh, oral immunotherapy using buca colostrum, as well as uh, minimal enteral nutrition. This is a global practice. We also practice rapid advancement in fits, which has been shown that not to have negative effect or not to have any significant risk of um, necrotizing enterocolitis. It has also been shown that if we hasten the time to full enteral phase, mobility is less and mortality is much reduced. And overall effect on the baby is optimal. So usually when you are monitoring these babies, you start from the time of birth and you plot on the graph. Your aim is to ensure that the baby follows a particular path, does not cross the, the, the chart and can follow that path or a little bit above it, but you don't want the baby to go down above that, which also brings to practice of individualizing weight gain. In our setting, the use of parental nutrition is been a challenge due to cost and availability. But in developed countries, this is very much available. Breast milk is a practice, is a routine. Formula feed is currently as is treated as a drug, and it must be recommended and prescribed before it is given on the world. That is a good practice, but this is also filled with some challenges. For instance, the mother's milk may not be available. And breast milk banking is a big challenge in our own setting. Power is a, a big problem. The cultural beliefs is another problem. The religious belief is also a major problem. So in Nigeria, we are not yet very vast in breast milk banking. It's an area to actually look into in terms of exploring and looking at ways of minimizing the challenges. We also think of using surrogate mothers. This is a little bit even more, it's a little bit gaining ground now, but we are also challenged with the issue of infectious diseases, particularly HIV, hepatitis, and all others. So in what where surrogate mothering is practiced, the routine is that all the surrogate mothers must give consent. The parents must also consent, and then the surrogate mothers must be tested for the major inf infections, particularly hepatitis and HIV. The supplements are routinely used, particularly for, for preterm. We talk about use of calcium, we talk about vitamins and, and all that, and iron. Next slide. So there are several growth charts that have been available. Most growth charts are actually by cross-sectional. They are also by, um, uh, combining different studies together. A lot of work has been done on growth chart from the period of 1967, even through the period of the appearance of intergrowth chart that completed the study in, two, in 2014 and published it in 2015. So it's a continuous effort. This chart can cover both the interuterine period as well as the postnatal period, it depends. But we also know that the gestational age covered is also determined by the methods that is used in the study and the population that, that is also studied. Next slide. So these are just examples of the growth chart. I won't bore us with this. If questions come, we can answer. So there are a lot of uh, limitations to, to growth charts. When you plan to develop a growth chart, you think about your sample size. It's a different, it's a difficult thing. Some are affected by small sample size. Some are affected by range of gestational age that is used. Then we also talk about the method that is used in calculating the gestational age. Some use the last menstrual period, which may not be reliable, while some use 
the the just the use of ultrasound, which is much much better. We know that recall may be a problem in remembering the last menstrual period, which may reduce the quality of data that will be gotten from such research. Then we also think about the year of publication. Previous ones might not have taken into consideration the level of quality and also the role of bias in collection of data. But recent ones have looked into ways of reducing bias, ways of increasing the quality, particularly the gestational age assessment. And a good example of that is the integral chart, which we'll talk about briefly. We also talk about the population that is studied. Are growth restricted babies removed? Is the role of altitude or ethnic or racial populations considered? Is there also a gender bias? All this can affect the, the growth chart. Next slide. Briefly about the intergrowth chart, this was international, had a cohort population. The gestational age was determined by ultrasound. The population was actually very large, spanned through five continents with a population of over 20,000. And it took place within a period of five years. About almost 4,000, over 4,600 women were enrolled. And assessment was clinical as well as population based. And they use similar instruments. This is a chart that is actually linked to the WHO child growth standard. Next slide. This is an example. The integral chart is uh, actually, um, we have the OFC, the weight and the height. And then also is also classified based on sex. Next slide. This is, this is another one. The both for male and female using weight, one for late preterm and the other one for moderate preterm. A little bit about this, the integral chart has a limitation in the sense that the sample size for the very pre extreme preterm was actually very small. So the gestational age that, is, that this sample actually covered is from 33 weeks. So we should note that even though it could be extrapolated to involve other less gestational age groups. But from the sample size, the gestational age of 33 weeks and above was fully well represented. Sorry, Next slide. Sorry um, can we, um, we are just running out of time. Can we just uh, finish the, the presentation, please? We need to, would that be okay? Yes, one minute, I'll be true. Thank you. Okay. Th these are the components. Next slide, please. The few preterm I've mentioned, the lower limit of the score, 33 weeks. Next slide. A lot of successes have been recorded. Currently over 125 countries use this. In my center, we actually started in 2020. Next slide. We've done a lot of training. It's been implemented, the nurses, the doctors, the residents. Next slide. And then some of the end users have their comments. Very unique methodology, G assessment by ultrasound. Apps are very user friendly, a comprehensive tool, are very practical. Next slide. So we have a lot of resources. They are on the net and they are available. They can be downloaded. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for inviting me. Thank you very much. Hello, Thank you, Taidi, so, um, and uh, welcome again, uh, Dr. Weaver, uh, Gillian Weaver. Um, so this session will be conducted in a way of like an interactive session between myself and uh, Dr. Weaver. Um, and uh, the topic as is displayed on the on you know on, online is that um, we discussing on the issue of human milk banking. So uh, I, I think uh, Dr. Aidi in her talk just now alluded to some of the issues uh, with, uh, with acquiring or obtaining uh, breast milk for use in an intensive care unit, especially for preterm babies. Uh, the limitation, uh, the cultural and religious aspects, uh, Gillian. 
So um, perhaps we should start from the beginning uh, and maybe let you tell us the experience that you have actually gone through, you know, in terms of uh, bringing up the passion of trying to solve or address this insufficiency and inadequacy and knowing how important it is uh, that mother's own milk is for, um, or even breast milk for preterm infants. How do you actually get everything together? You know, it, it, it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle, right? And trying to get all these pieces together or be, trying to build a house from a foundation that you need to have all these bits and pieces together. So how do you do that? Maybe you can share with us that experience, actually. Before I say anything, can I please just to say I'm not a doctor. I'm very um, uh, delighted that I've been conferred this honorary status for the uh, for this afternoon. But just just to be clear, in case anyone... It's all right. You're so up. expert in this field. We need to talk to on this. <laughs> I just, I just, I just need to say that because you know people do a lot of studies to become a doctor, and um, I've I've worked in the field for over thirty years, so I'm I'm happy to be um, described as an expert. But but just so I just so I say that, um, do you know what? There are a number of challenges um, for sure that um, that need to be overcome to set up a milk bank. But um, those challenges very much depend on whether you're looking at the sort of local challenges just the usual sort of things of getting funding and the logistics and finding the right place to, to put it and equipment and training and all that sort of thing. Um, those are, those I think are the straightforward things. Those are the things that can actually be overcome. The most yeah. important challenge is to ensure that you have a consensus that uh, donor milk is wanted, that it's needed and that it's going to be used appropriately in support of what is the most important thing, which is to um, ensure that babies have um, access as soon as possible to their mum's colostrum mm. and transitional milk and, 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 and milk. So, um, and ensuring that uh, there's, there's that consensus. My experience has been this does vary. You can get pockets of enormous enthusiasm for introducing donor milk onto a unit or into a, into um, feeding protocols, um, but you can also have those who remain very, very sceptical. And so it's, it's, convincing, it's convincing those that have maybe never used donor milk. Um, it's making sure that donor milk is used appropriately. And that is so, that is, that is so very important. Um, and then uh, speaking with one, with one voice, I think setting up local initially setting up local facilities where there have been none in the country, you need to really, you know, look at the, the, the national picture and how best to develop a resource nationally um, so that, uh, you know, you can equitably make donor milk available. And that's where the real challenge comes, because there you need to obviously convince policymakers, you need to, um, to make sure everybody's uh, speaking with the, same, with the same voice, and you need to think about how best to deliver that. Yes, thank, thank you for that. Um, so what are your um, thoughts on regionalization of, um, say, uh, like a little milk bank for just to cater for just that area itself which may have let's say about five to ten hospitals rather than having a, a national milk bank i mean it depends you know if you're in the united states where it's such a big country you may need to have regionalization maybe maybe more feasible i suppose and uh, more appropriate but if you're talking a small country like singapore who, who recently established a human milk bank, it's probably easier to have a national milk bank. So I'm thinking of, um, you know, each hospital in our, in, in my situation where we're trying to have a little mini milk bank, where we process um, uh, the milk itself and um, we do a bit of uh, hum uh, milk sharing. And I think like alluded by Dr. Aidi, you know, there is issue with uh, milk kinship in, in a big human milk banking setting where, you know, there's issue of, um, you know, I'm sure 
you know about the milk kinship, you know, that, um, you know, uh, you become a biological uh, related uh, mother and child if you consume the breast milk from a donor uh, for five times. So that becomes an issue uh, with setting up a human milk bank. And um, so what we do now is, is more of a sharing, one-to-one uh, -one sharing rather than having a milk bank. Uh, until recently where, um, you know, some place, uh, there's a place in, in, in Malaysia that we have a Sharia compliant milk bank recently. So I think this issue sort of becomes a major kind of a hurdle for uh, in terms of the religious context. And you have to be very careful with the use of uh, milk bank. And maybe you can share with us your experience, you know, in helping such countries address this problem. Okay, well, you of course have to start somewhere, but I think you have to go back and look at the national, the national picture and get a consensus that eventually you want to be able to make donor milk available equitably because I don't think it's, it, it's ethical to have some babies able to access donor milk and, and, and others not to be. And if we look globally, if we learn from what's happening globally, um, the most successful, there are different models of milk banking. Um, and, and one of those models, absolutely for sure, is, is the provision of donor milk within an Islamic setting. Um, but the, I suppose the most successful, or not suppose, I know that the most successful model of milk banking that we all look up to is the Brazil model, where they have very, very many um, milk banks. Um, and, and so uh, all babies will be able to access donor milk if it's required all mothers on neonatal units and then, and then um, kangaroo mother care um, units will be able to donate their milk as well as, as, well as um, throughout. But they started with a few. Once upon a time, there were half a dozen milk banks in, in, in Brazil. And then it's a huge country um, with a big population uh, and um, they chose to, do, to develop lots of milk banks in order to be able to provide a service that was integrated into the lactation support services that were there and that are so very important. So the, the milk banks weren't established in isolation. If you then look at another setting, you mentioned, not, you mentioned uh, North, North America, there there's a very different model of having um, a, a service, a large central services of which they have grown quite considerably in number. So there are over 30 now, but uh, again, sort of 20 years ago, there, there were probably less than 10. Um, and, uh, but, but there they have, um, uh, they work as a, as, a, as a network and they're able to um, support hospitals over a very, over a very wide um, region. Um, a good model to look at from recent times is, is in Vietnam. And that goes back to the decision being made really at national and then regional level that, that human milk banks were something that was, that was wanted. Uh, but they chose, they looked at where would be the most ideal setting to set one up, what a setting where they knew that the, the optimal support for lactation and breastfeeding was already in place. So a lot of thought had already gone into that, because I think this is really important not to rush in, not to rush into things, to look at what can be done initially to ensure that babies have every opportunity to get their own mother's milk. First and foremost. So just and to jump having, in there, sorry, Jim, yeah. just in there, because it's a very important point you raised. So can you share with us those important components that you say, you know, to that the Vietnam model actually is based on, you know, how to how do you identify uh, the circumstances and you know factors that can actually uh, uh, you know make, which actually provide the nurturing for the development of a of a successful milk bank, for instance. Okay, for instance. okay. Because, because actually, you know, if you've got great lactation and breastfeeding support in place, then you're going to need less donor milk, but you're also going to have more mothers who potentially will be able to donate milk. So it, it's, a, it's a kind of self-serving um, system that you're, set, that you're setting up. But I think the first thing is to, is to look at if mothers and babies are being separated. If mothers and babies are being separated, you're much more likely to need Somebody else's somebody else's milk. Um, it's it, uh, so 
keeping mothers and babies together when mothers and babies are, are together and if they can't be physically together on you know because the baby's on the on the neonatal unit and is being cared for in isolation there then um then making sure that the mothers are as, as close physically and that any colostrum and milk that they express can very quickly be transported to the milk bank um ensuring that mothers are taught how to uh, express their milk and collect their co collect their colostrum preferably within the first hour and this is this is so important um, not separating mothers and babies unnecessarily you know you see in so many circumstances where um, you know because maybe uh, the mothers had a, had a had a section it's mm -hmm. no reason to separate mom and baby they can still they can still be together the mum can still put the baby to the breast the baby and she can and if that's not possible she can um, she can be expressing her milk even while even yeah. while she's being, um, being, yes, you know, having a suture. Sorry, Gillian, so, but that, um, that's exactly sorry to cut you in there because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's very important you raise the issue. Yes, that's ideal, but unfortunately, in many diverse societies, the low middle income groups, you know, because of home environment, uh, transportation problems, um, large families at home that nobody else can take care of, there's just no way the yeah. mothers can actually get to their babies in the nursery for all these reasons. And that's why it's so difficult to keep them together. I know it is the way to go, but it, circumstances dictate that it, this cannot happen. And that's why it's not the major problem we are facing. Yeah, okay. And 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 I, I really just want to point out that this just needs to be a focus for attention, that to just make sure that everything is being done. And that was what they did in Vietnam. And they and they looked at the hospital that that would that had demonstrated that they would have thought about all these things and they were doing everything they could. Now there will always be instances where mothers and babies are separated, where it's very difficult logistically to to get them the, the, the mother's milk. You can put in place all sorts of things to ensure that that happens as soon as possible. Uh, in terms of donor milk and setting up the milk bank, well, then um, having access to, to supplies, you can look at whether it makes more sense to have a model milk bank that you set up initially, that you, that you fund and you set up initially, and you test acceptability. You ask about the acceptability of donor milk. You look at your, you look at your, uh, the families that are being served, and you make sure that, that the donor milk is acceptable. In, in, in countries where, that are, uh, where the, uh, with the Islamic faith and where, where milk kinship is, 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 uh, you know, is, is, is a factor, um, then working with the religious with the religious leaders, which is what they absolutely did in, in Singapore and also in Iran, where there are now more than 10 milk banks and, and in Malaysia as well, where the first milk bank was set up. Work in tandem, make sure that, uh, that, that the, the religious leaders are involved, that they understand how the process works and that you have very good um, tracking available so that you can make sure that you know exactly which milk has gone to which, which, which baby. And if you are able to identify single donors for single recipients, that's great, but that doesn't always happen in the practicalities no. of a baby needing milk over a long period of time. I was just wondering, Gillian, shall we share your video now? Would that... Uh... Um, yes, because one of the things I did want to point out was that where you do have donor milk, of course, it can be very supportive of um, of mothers producing, starting to produce their milk. And so there's just 20 second clip um, from a from a video that is the fourth birthday video from the Human Milk Foundation, which was just a couple a couple of days ago. And I just picked out 20 seconds. I hope everybody will go and watch the full video. But these 20 seconds just show the the responses from from some families. The donor milk absolutely changed everything. It's fine human breast milk from these amazing women it took a lot of the stress away. It gave me hope. I felt this release of pressure. Just having that milk took all the anxiety away. And I genuinely, I think I started breathing for the first time. And with that, my milk came. It's really just the most amazing gift anyone could give me. And it's, it's that quote yeah. there. I felt br I was able to breathe for the first time. And I think that's one of the most important um, benefits of having access to donor milk, whether you have a milk bank or whether you have access to donor milk that come from, you know, a local milk bank or a milk bank that's 50 or 100 miles away, just knowing that it's there can be so supportive of that mother's lactation. 
Um, well, now we go to our third um, uh, session. Uh, that's, that'll be uh, with Dr. Shushma. Dr. Shushma, you're online? Yes. Yes, hello. Well, Dr. Shushma, um, you work in a busy and ICU setting as, uh, you know, in the, as I introduced you just now with about 3,000 over uh, admissions uh, a year. So it's obviously going to um, impact on how, you know, uh, healthcare practitioners in a NICU will try to use their precious time or their very little time, in fact, to, um, to educate or to, um, to uh, help mothers to produce breast milk for their preterm infants. So perhaps you can share with us, you know, the program that you may have in terms of capacity training um, for, you know, for your staff to actually address this area of need, actually. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chia, for uh, having me here. And I'm so happy to be a part of this webinar where we have Jillian and ID and other people and of course, Dr. Cho. So <clears throat> uh, the first thing that's important about uh, telling our healthcare workers to ensure that there is human milk in the NICU is letting them know that it is critical. So it's the family as well as our healthcare workers need to understand that it is critical for their small little baby who is there in the NICU. So for that purpose, I mean, the first thing that we would start with telling our healthcare workers and mothers is that even if you produce a baby at 25 weeks, 26 weeks, you can lactate and there is milk for the baby. So the nature has actually created things in a manner that milk is there. And so that is a natural choice for your baby to be given. And then we need to <clears throat> further on add that these babies have not grown completely in utero. They have not developed all their organs and systems, which need to further grow and develop. And for that, the best thing that is available is mother's own milk. And it is superior to any other milk that is available. <clears throat> we also make them in, you know, understand that the mother's own milk, that is the biologic mother's milk is better than even the donated milk. And of course, it is far superior to the milk that is tinned milk or formula milk. And to make it more simpler or clearer, for every organ that needs to grow, there are those factors, the growth factors, which are available only and only in the mother's own milk. So if you think of the gut, the gut has to double its size in the last 15 weeks of gestation. And that is the baby that is with us from 25 weeks to 40 weeks. So the gut has to grow for it to grow, for its surface area to increase, for it to be able to absorb the milk that is being put into the gut. It's mother's milk that is required. It has all those components so that the gut will grow. It will produce those hormones and enzymes. I'm just giving example of one organ. Similarly, for the lung, we are ventilating babies. We are putting them on CPAP. There's a lot of inflammation that's going on. There is a lot of injury that's occurring. So the mother's milk has the antioxidants. The mother's milk has all the anti-inflammatory, uh, you know, uh, substances which will help the lung to heal. So once our nursing uh, uh, professionals, healthcare workers understand this aspect. This is what is transmitted to the mothers and they understand that it's crucial for their baby to heal, for their baby to recover. They need to provide their own milk. And we all understand that both the severity as well as the incidence of sepsis, necrotizing enterocolitis, ROP, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, all of these are much reduced if the baby receives mother's own milk right from the beginning. If it has had a if the babies had a good start and not just during the neonatal period, even later on. So once the family, the parents, mother and the healthcare workers understand, then they are much more motivated to be able to, you know, pump out the milk or hand express. In our part of the world, much of the mothers are hand expressing milk and that's the technique taught to them. Of course, some of them do pump the milk, but many of them hand express the milk and that's what's provided. So do you have like a, um, a, a program, uh, a regular training program for your health, uh, for your staff in the NICU um, in this, in this, you know, in this aspect of um, 
trying to educate parents and, and encourage them to, uh, to produce the uh, breast milk, um, especially, you know, in, in your situation where um, there may be issue with excess, you know, like I said, you know, well, at least my setting, sometimes mothers, uh, they, they couldn't go to the nursery, um, mm -hmm. you know, because of a transportation issue cost as well. Um, and obviously there are a lot of mothers who are also rather sick, you know, uh, because of medical illness as well, they deliver uh, preterm. And uh, these are the mothers who actually need a lot of support. So how do you deal with these different situations? Uh, maybe you can share your, you know, how yeah. you deal with these issues. True. So, so let's start from the first point. We have a, a well-established system of antenatal counseling. So when the mothers, the pregnant women are coming to our obstetric uh, department, every day our counselors are going to the antenatal clinics and they are talking to mothers and families in groups, sometimes one is to one, and they are taking their question answers. And they are also distributing some pamphlets. So this happens repeatedly whenever the mother is coming for the antenatal uh, checkup. So she is kind of mentally tuned to this fact that I need to provide my milk for my baby. That's what is going to help my baby. If the baby is healthy, baby is going to be with me in the postnatal ward. But if the baby happens to be sick, the baby would be in the NICU. In that sorry, case, Dr. Shushma, so, sorry, I just want to clarify. So in your setting, uh, this education antenatally is conducted by the obstetric side or your side? Our side. We have oh. the milk bank counselors. We have our counselors in the milk bank who are our nurses. We've trained them, and mm -hmm. they are now the ones who are going and conducting these sessions in the. So these patients go. Sorry. So these patients go to the antenatal clinic, and then as part of the visit, they will also uh, have counseling from the uh, milk bank or lactational consultants. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah. Exactly. Great. So it's the lactation consultants who are walking down and going to the obstetric area to mm -hmm. the antenatal clinics and talking to the mothers in groups, showing them some posters, giving them some pamphlets and answering their questions. Then mm -hmm. is the early initiation. So all births that occur in our hospital, if the baby can be initiated directly on the breast, fine. If not early, mm -hmm. um, so, so as you want to do things within the first one hour, which is the golden hour started first, and colostrum, that is important, has to be harvested. So some of our lactation counselors are actually going around to mothers, harvesting that colostrum and getting it to the NICU, which is used for mouth painting of a baby or feeding the baby. And we provide mother with adequate information on how to express, how frequently to express night feeds are important and they need to uh, be there for pumping so that they do get some rest if they can pump enough for one or two feeds. So most babies would get their fresh uh, milk from their own mother. Of course, the milk bank is there to support the requirement in case if they cannot. And family participatory care is one of our kind of strong uh, aspects where the mother is in the NICU and fathers also are in the NICU providing kangaroo care, both mother and father. Mother is doing taking care of activities of daily living for the baby, changing nappies, helping in the baby's weighing, helping in baby's suctioning. And they are of, of course doing kangaroo mother care. So the more they are with the baby, the more better is the letdown of milk. And uh, they can you know kind of produce more volume of milk, which is required for their baby. And then when they monitor the growth of the baby, you know, when they ask the nurses, they are happier knowing that uh, the babies are growing or what is the rate of growth that is occurring. Okay, so what I was saying was that there is a, a compendium, there is a compendium of uh, something that is freely available on the internet, which is evidence-based. And we can look at that. My nurses and residents regularly have an access to that and they look at it. And this is by the name of Provide, which has instructional videos, which is in different sections, about seven of them, which is looking at different aspects of NICU care, maternal aspects, maternal drug use, and so on. And this has instructional pamphlets as well as videos. So there is information that is just enough for healthcare worker or mother to look at. And it doesn't have a lot of, it, it does have science in a very simplified language. So it does have science, but it is easily understand. Well, 
um, I think we are losing you. Yeah, uh, but I think that was a good sum up. I think uh, we heard the last bit that um, she was trying, uh, Dr. Shushma was trying to share with us uh, one of the toolkits, you know, on um, provide where you can help her parents and healthcare providers to optimize, you know, the use of uh, or uh, obtaining the breast milk. Um, so I think uh, we're going to go to the Q&A, but uh, before that, I'd just like to thank all the three speakers. And I think uh, just briefly that uh, they have shared wonderfully in terms of, you know, Dr. Ayidi talked about how integral charts can be applied in a diverse setting. And it's a longitudinal chart it, uh, it, it represents uh, diverse societies, you know, uh, different parts of the world. Um, and it is longitudinal, so it's representative, you know, especially for the 33 weeks and above uh, growth, uh, uh, 33 weeks preterm and above um, growth. Uh, but the only issue is that the more preterm one, the lower gestation one may not be represented by that chart. And we just need to know how to use it, interpret it correctly. And uh, Dr. Jillian, uh, sorry, Jillian Weaver, I've given her honorary doctor status. Um, Jillian Weaver sh uh, showed us how human, ba human milk banking can be feasible. And we're gonna discuss more about it. And I think the important point to raise here is that, you know, you need to look at the locality, you need to look at the resources, you need to look at the acceptance uh, to ensure the success of uh, building or establishing a human milk bank and engaging, you know, uh, people that are very important, religious experts as well, you know, in the process. And finally, Dr. Shushma tells us how important it is to work together that the neonatal team, the lactation team actually can go to the antenatal unit to try to educate parents early in terms of the use of breast milk. Uh, and how they can actually promote the process of lactation early on. Um, I think with all this, fantastic. I've learned a lot and I, 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 I also would like to uh, hear more in a Q&A session. And for now, um, I'm going to hand over to my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Lydia Wusu. Lydia? I would like to introduce Lydia. Um, oh, Lydia sorry. is a, a lecturer. The, uh, from the Department of Nursing at Kowame Nukra University of Science and Technology in Ghana. She is also, as I've mentioned, part-time faculty at the Ghana College of Nurses and Midwives. She's a registered nurse and a registered dietitian. Welcome, Lydia. Many thanks to you, and I welcome everybody. Um, we'll go straight away to the Q&A session, and along the line, we'll be introducing the polls again. We will start introducing the polls again along the line. And so I have a first question from Tony who is asking um, that he would like to ask in case for infants have some abnormality, the nutrients which they will be given in milk, will it be directly targeted at the abnormality? Can I have any of my panel responding to this for us? I think we'll go to Dr. Ayede, can we hear your views on this? So if the infant has an abnormality, for instance, you have an infant who is born with birth asphyxia and you are providing milk, the new trends, will you be looking at new trends that will target the asphyxia or the entire growth of the baby? Okay, thank you. Like I've said in the presentation, the most important thing is for the entire growth to be targeted. And then there are protocols for each illness in a newborn. Once oral feeds are not contraindicated, the baby should be on human milk normally. And the human milk contains all the nutrients that is necessary for normal growth. Even though there may be situations in which you need to add, but that will also be medically determined. But as a general rule, it is assumed that the breast milk is sufficient, but you monitor and, and then you determine if there is a, a reason to, to add. But specifically, there is no particular, um, um, particular ingredient that is targeted at a particular illness. But what is needed is for you to prevent infection 
ensure the baby has adequate growth and then bone mineralization is normal, hematological parameters are normal. So it's an holistic approach. Thank you. All right, thank you. Gillian, would you want to add to that? No, I don't think so, thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question. We'll move on to the next question where Kimberly is asking that Dr. Ayede to speak to the current situation of recording your natal feet while in patients in the medical chats. Dr. Ayede, what's the current situation of recording your natal feet during the medical in the inpatient? So the current recommendation is that all, all care related to patients, including newborns, should be documented in the case notes or the depending on the method you are using, hard copy or electronic. And feeding is not excluded. All feeds should be documented, both in the treatment chart and on the nursing chart, and also recommendations at the time of ward run. So there are at least three places where you will have recommendations documented in the patient's chart. Once the review documented by the reviewing doctor, secondly, the treatment chart, thirdly, the nursing chart, who carries out that responsibility. So it should be, it should be documented. Okay, so the next one that Kimberly wanted to know, how quality and complete is this right now? I think you've talked about that, so won't spend much time, but what needs to be improved data-wise? I'm um, still on Dr. Ayede. What needs to be improved? What do you think needs to be improved in terms of uh, data in the neonatal settings? Okay, generally speaking, uh, data collection, data quality assurance are all parts of uh, um, quality assurance of newborn care. We know that what is recommended now is that you write your whatever you want to do, and as you do it, you also document. So there is a documentation for recommending. There is another documentation for the doing. So these aspects need to be improved. The other aspect that needs to be improved is the timing taba. Some, like if you have a very busy NICO, like, like Chushman has said, have a very busy NICO, and you have very few nurses, like in low and middle income countries, there is a tendency for you to say, okay, I have five babies, I have 10 babies, let me feed all of them. When I finish, I'll come and document. That is also not correct. As you feed the baby, you document immediately so that there is no miss up. So the, it, that has to be improved. Of course, also the use of evidence-based, there's a lot to be improved actually. Like, the rate, like I, we discussed earlier, the rate, the time of commencement of enteral feeds, Gone are the days that you say you, you wait five days, 10 days. No, with the 24 hours in, in stable babies, then also the rate of increase. People have also moved. Research has shown that you can have increment of 30 to 40 means per kg per day increment. So we have moved away from 10 to, to 20. That also has to be to be improved upon moving to the to the F to ensure that you actually practice and use evidence-based interventions. Then the issue of um, is a different thing for you to generate data. It's also another thing for you to utilize the data. So data utilization also needs to be improved. So people sit on large data. They are not published. We don't know where, what, the, what this is. They are not shared. Information is being lost. We cannot learn from their experiences. So the issue of data utilization, we also have to be improved. And we also, the last point is that it is currently recommended that all NICOs in particular should have routine data collection. Routine, it should be routine. And that I'm sure Shushman is practicing that in our own center. So, so these are areas, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Ayedi on that. Now, I would also want to find out, have there been any barriers, Killian? What are some of the major challenges when you were integrating the human milk or donor milk 
banking? What were some of the main challenges and how were you able to navigate them? Okay, so as I alluded to earlier, I think when you're introducing donor milk onto a neonatal unit, some of the major challenges are making sure um, that everybody understands um, exactly what the donor milk is and perhaps more importantly, what it isn't. And what it isn't is maternal milk. So it isn't the mother's own milk going to her own baby. And that needs to always be remembered as we've, as, as we've alluded to. I notice in one of the other questions, there's a question about, about, about growth and whether babies grow as well on donor milk as, uh, as, as on, as on the mother's own milk. And in a way, it's it's almost it's it's not that it's an irrelevant question, but you should never be feeding donor milk to a baby where the mother's own milk is is available. Um, the do, the question is, do babies grow um, on donor milk rather than uh, an, another option? But the main challenge I think is making sure that everybody is very aware of how to use the donor milk. Um, uh, there are some practical things about where it's stored and and so on, but there are guidelines and there's a global community to help everybody to to find answers to any of those questions. Professor Sushma has, has alluded to it. I've put in the in the chat um, links to uh, toolkit uh, frameworks for um, that, that give lots of support and help and, and help to everybody. Um, but actually, and then I suppose the other thing is ensuring that um, that families. Uh, are aware and are able to give informed consent to the use of, of, of donor milk, and that's very important. And again, another question asks, how do you how do you convince parents? And I would say, in the same way that you convince parents about anything that is happening and any decisions that are being made on the neonatal unit, parents uh, need an explanation as to why the donor milk is needed and what they can do to minimise um, that need. Um, uh, but then also what the donor milk is, um, who the donors are. Who the donors are is very, very important. And I think that when everyone understands that by and large, the, the donors are, are basically kind mothers who are sharing their milk uh, to help other families and, uh, and, 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 and other babies, and that they do this um, you know, for no better reason than to, than to kind of share their love and, and, and support for other families. Um, and, and that takes away quite a lot of the suspicion um, that, you know, that this is that, that, uh, around, uh, around donor milk. Does that answer your question enough or were there other things you wanted me to add? For me, the way I do it is that, you know, I, 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 I've, as a practitioner, I advise and counsel my parents that the uh, donor milk is just bridging the gap. It is in the interim period, you know, that while we work hard with the mother to produce her own milk for her own baby. So in the, in the end, all babies should be fed with the mother's own milk. And I think that should be the principle. Very few mothers who cannot, you know, that's exceptional, you know, cases and may be dependent on donor milk as an option. But I see the donor milk is important during the initial period where we're trying to feed the baby entirely as fast as and as early as possible. But at the time when the mothers are still um, coping with her own illness, her medical condition, and she's stressed out, uh, she's not able to, but we give her all the support. And it's just like your 20 second clip, you know, she, the, her fear was elevated because she could get the support from donor milk. But, you know, once the stress is gone, and then later on, when we work with her and support her, her mood just come. And that's the way it should be. I think that's a very important point I thought I should share. Thanks. Yeah. Can, I, can I just add, I think we've put mothers, families, but mothers in a very difficult situation. We tell them that how important it is, particularly for preterm and sick, low birth weight, sick babies in, in hospital, where we're, we're putting a lot of pressures on families for, for, the, for the mother to be able to produce this milk, which no matter how much she, she wants to do it, um, you know, the more stress she's under, the more that will interfere with yeah. her establishing a milk. The vicious cycle. <laughs> it is, it's, a vicious, it's very much a vicious cycle. And donor milk has been shown, it's been proven. I love your terminology, bridging the gap. It kind of can break that cycle because actually having told mothers that we don't want their babies to have formula, um, we then say we need we need your milk. And, you know, by in two hours time, we need this volume <laughs> of milk. 
Um, and, yeah. you know, it's knowing, just, just that, they're, that, knowing yeah. that they're babies, yeah. once they understand what the donor milk yeah. is, once they, once they know about all the things that are involved in the process to reduce, minimize any risk, mm -hmm. the fact that donors are screened, the fact that the milk is by and large heat treated and tested and so on. So making sure that that is all understood, that mm -hmm. um, having accepted that donor milk um, is available to use, it then, and I've seen it so many times, that it just takes the pressure off and it's like you just can open the tap and the milk will start to come. Mm -hmm. All right, so now that we are still talking about the donor milk, let me ask, um, for those of us in some um, in some countries like mine, we, ha we have not started the use of human milk banking, but there's a question on the donors. Who are the donors? How do you get access to the donors? How do you get people to donate? Okay, so this, this varies according to different models that I mentioned around the world. But in, in Africa, um, the, the milk banks that I've worked with in, in, in Kenya and in, uh, uh, in more recently in Uganda and, and also in, on the neonatal units in, in South Africa, most of the donors are mothers who are, who are there. Their babies are also being cared for on the neonatal units or in the kangaroo mother care ward. And locally, they're, they're the mothers who share their milk. They're, in order to establish their own milk supply, often they're um, expressing more than their, than their baby needs at that, at that time. We know that for mums to get a good enough milk supply to be able to sustain breastfeeding on an ongoing basis, you know, within a couple of weeks, they need to be producing quite substantial amounts of milk, around 600 mils a day or, or, or more. And, and so if their baby is fluid restricted or if their baby is very small and only requiring small amounts, they're producing more milk than their babies need. Now, um, with, uh, they, can, they can then donate that milk. Um, obviously, with their, again, with their consent and, and understanding. And much of the Brazilian system is based around this. And it's kind of solidarity between mothers and families um, within, the, within, the, within the hospital. In terms of donors who aren't, who aren't in the hospital, whose babies are at home in the community, um, who are being um, asked to, to donate their milk. Do you know what? The, if you tell women who, um, who are breastfeeding that, uh, that their milk could be shared and could help other babies, uh, particularly the other babies in hospital, so many will want to do it. And one of the problems that I've never had, one of the challenges that I've never had in human milk banking is in getting enough donors. Once you get the word out, and we live in a society now where with social media and with the ease at which it's possible to spread messages, you can get the message out there very quickly. There are logistical challenges, obviously, of recruiting mothers in the community, how their milk is stored at home or whether they need to come into the hospital to or to the milk bank to express their milk. There are logistical um, questions around um, uh, transporting their milk safely and, and so on. Those can all be overcome. Um, and as I said, there's a sort of global community out there that can help to show how, how they've done it in, 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 their, in their country. Um, but in the, case of, in the case of Ghana, then um, there are, you have lots of lots of uh, colleagues now throughout Africa that you can talk to and learn from their experiences and there'll be lots of people happy to help you. Yeah, thank you. So there was another question in terms of storage. Um, are the milk stored in a separate place and when it's needed, they go for it or they, there's a storage in the NICU where they are stored and therefore you can easily have access to it to feed when it's time to feed? Is there a separate storage or is stored in the NICU? Well, I can answer that, but I'm conscious that I'm talking a lot and Professor Sushma is, has got immense experience in India. So let me answer quickly from, from one perspective and then, and then maybe she can, can add in from her, from, her, from her perspective. It depends on the system. If you, have, if you have a milk bank in the hospital, then by and large, most of the milk will stay in, stay in the milk bank in the hospital and can be transported to the NICU or the pediatric ward or wherever it's needed on a daily basis, according to you know, how, much is, how much is likely to be needed. If the milk bank is, is, is a long way away or it's in another hospital, um, then, uh, then the, the, the NICU or there can be uh, a, a, a some place, um, a milk kitchen or somewhere um, in, the in the hospital uh, that uh, some frozen milk can be supplied. What's great is if you can have 
small volumes because most babies who are going to need it need really quite small volumes. So, so that will reduce that will reduce wastage. Uh, but it really depends on on the on the circumstances, and everything is possible. Okay, thank you. Now I'll go to Dr. Sushma. I'm still talking about the human milk um, banking system. Um, how did you gain the acceptance among your staff or the, your staff to use it? How did you gain the acceptance of your staff regarding the human milk banking? Dr. Sushma, um, how did you get your colleagues and then your <laughs> staff to accept the human milk? You know, we have different, we are from different cultural um, backgrounds with diverse diversity in terms of our beliefs and all. How did you get your, how did you gain the support? With, uh, in the context of, uh, you know, different religious beliefs and all that, uh, milk okay. kinship and so, all that, right? So yeah. people on board, because most of the times we, we did not have enough, uh, we did not have enough milk and babies needed to be fed formula. So as soon as this came up as an option, so there was there was an immediate buy-in kind of in terms of the colleagues or the staff accepting to use the uh, donor milk in the unit. The only thing that we need to to establish milk kitchens in both our NICUs because there are little away from the milk bank which is in the hospital milk that whatever we calculate and and that's kept in the hand expression is stored in the refrigerator the regular domestic refrigerator and it is fed to the babies so uh, i mean as far as acceptance goes we really didn't face a problem even in different religious communities as parents there wasn't an issue in terms of milk uh, for their babies Okay, thank you very much. Um, in terms of contamination, the issue of contamination, no milk easily gets contaminated. How do you deal with it? In terms of contamination, how do you manage contamination issues? Okay, so within the milk kitchen, we have a clean zone and, an, and a zone which is not the clean zone. So asepsis is maintained, the nurse who is handling the milk has to uh, go through all steps of hand washing, gowning, mask, cap, and then she is handling the milk. She pours it into uh, the pallida through which it is, it is fed to the baby or it's taken out. So it, it's done in every two hours by a single nurse in that shift who's looking after the feeding of the babies. And it's done under complete asepsis. So we haven't run into problems of contamination or the babies developing diarrhea or something like that. Okay. I think this has been a very in in interesting oh, sorry, session. Ali, yeah, I, I, have, I really have a burning question. I hope you can. <laughs> I like to, Please go uh, ahead. Julian, sure. I like to ask Gillian, you know, um, my, my hospital, my NICU has got the pasteurizer. And uh, in terms of um, sharing, you know, one-to-one, -one, uh, we do facilitate that sometimes. And, uh, you know, the parents will come and talk and then they will decide that, okay, we'll go ahead with this sharing. And then the milk kinship, all that has been established, everything. Um, they're happy with it. Um, my question is, you know, it's a different process, right? I, mean, I, I see that you were in Ember and then creating policies. You know, I'm sure in terms of uh, donating blood, uh, human milk, there is a process of screening. Uh, there is also blood investigations required, you know. Uh, but if we were to skip all this and just pasteurize the milk, would this be acceptable in terms of safety? Well, Acceptable to who? Because actually, acceptable it really only for... needs to be acceptable to you. Uh, and well, so, yes, and so to me, in terms of so how I conform yeah. to the regulations, the optimal yeah. screening and all that, you know? Okay. okay. So, by and large, everything comes as a package. So, you screen the donor, you test the milk, 
um, you, pas- you pasteurise the milk. And that kind of gives you a triple whammy, if you like, of, of, of safety. Um, if you're not able to do any of those, then heat treating the milk um, will reduce the risk of infection um, that because, uh, because the viruses and bacteria in the, in the milk um, will, be, will be inactivated. And so, yes, that will, that will help. However, pasteurization you know, does come with some downsides as well in that it, it not only reduces levels of bacteria um, and, uh, and so makes it safer in that aspect, um, but it reduces some of the, the, um, you know, the anti-infective agencies, exactly. the immune components that are, that are, that are yep. in the milk too. Mm-hmm. Now, if, you, if your donor, if, you, if you've got, uh, to be absolutely sure, I would recommend that you ask your donor to do, to do some screening, to do some blood, to do some blood tests. Um, or look at their most recent blood test because most mothers in hospital have had recent recent blood tests um, antenatally or, or uh, you know uh, when they when they went into labour and so and so looking at those the pasteurise the pasteurisation will make it safer but it, I would also say you then need to check the milk afterwards the pasteurisation has worked because you don't want to have the worst of worst of all worlds and. When you're using a pasteurizer, it's really important that everybody knows how to use it and that it's used and maintained regularly. So having having one that's only used occasionally is not a great thing either. Everybody needs to know how to work it and how to recognize if it's, if it's not working. And that it's not just the heat treatment, it's very rapid cooling that is important. It's making sure that the milk isn't interfered with or contaminated afterwards, that it goes straight into the fridge or the freezer, depending on what your what you're going to do. So it's not an easy question. Uh, the bottom line is the only people that need to be assured of this is, is you as the clinicians responsible for, for feeding the babies. There are no global regulations um, and there are only recommendations and recommendations differ. Thank you, Gillian. I'm really sorry to stop this conversation on such an exciting session, but we've uh, we've come to uh, to the end of our time. So I would like to thank. Um, oh, just a quick reminder that this uh, Lacta Hub has been recorded and will be available soon on lactahub.org. Lacta webinar and Shushma has already. Oh, yes, Gillian. Can I just ask one very, can I just say one very, very important thing? There's a question in the chat about how long should a baby be fed after six months, should breastfeed after six months. Can we just say as long as the mother and the baby wants to? I'm just... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for answering that one. Uh, Shushma has shared her slides with us uh, and all the slides will be shared as well on uh, lactahub.org lacta webinar. So we will put all our materials there. And my sincere thanks to our special guests today, uh, Professor Cho and Lydia Wusa for moderating these sessions and Dr. Ayidi Gillian Weaver and Professor Shushma for their expertise. And, um, and for you, um, for sharing your, um, and to you, the participants, for your engagement, and to our team, Kai, Cassandra, Julia, and Alex and Blatlena for the work in the background. And uh, please help us develop and improve these webinars by completing the feedback form that will follow up uh, this event. And uh, so to close today's webinar, I would like to once again, thanks the speakers and the audience, and wish you all a lovely rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.